Welcome to the 2022 Federal Election Scrutineering Guidelines. We at Stand Up and Vote are providing this as a service for everybody in the whole country, no matter what political party you are and uh, no matter what your political ideology is. It is important that voting is done fairly and the counting is done fairly so that we get a result that the whole country can have faith in the outcome of the election. And perhaps more so than before, this year, 2022, this is an important issue that needs to be addressed. So please concentrate on what is going to be presented here for you because this is the most important election in many decades. It is an unknown factor at this stage what the result will be, but everybody has to feel very comfortable with the outcome at the end. So let's get it right. And to do that, we have to scrutineer correctly. You would be aware if you are looking at this that you cannot be a scrutineer unless somebody who is a candidate has authorized you to scrutineer the um, vote count. So that process would have already happened for you. Now we're going to have a look at the process of what happens when you are actually at the electoral booth and you are counting the vote. The source for all of this information, you can find it at www.aec.gov.au and there is a section there about learn about elections and in there is a scrutineer's handbook. I recommend that to everybody, particularly if you're going to be a scrutineer, do take the time. It's over 70 pages, but it is worth your trouble to go through that in detail. We'll be highlighting the most important facets as we go through this presentation. There are rules about scrutineering. There are acceptable things that you can do and unacceptable things. The acceptable things are you must, this is an absolute must, wear the identification badge that the AEC has supplied to you in all polling places. That designates you as a scrutineer, so you have the authority to wear that. So you must wear it when you've got it. You may observe all voting procedures even before the count starts, except you cannot be looking over the shoulder of an elector actually voting unless the elector has requested assistance. And there is a process that you would have to go through to do that and you would check with your divisional returning officer about how to do that. Very, very rare occurrence, I might add. You may object to the right of any person to vote if you perhaps happen to know of an individual who is not a citizen of Australia who is voting or is trying to vote in your dead grandmother's name, you will probably object to that. So you definitely have um, the right to object to that if, uh, if you come across something like that. You may be nominated by an, an elector to assist with the completion of a ballot paper. And this is a fairly common occurrence, but there is a process that has to be um, undertaken for that. And of course, not just anybody can do that. It has to be done correctly. You may enter and leave the polling place at any time during voting and or counting, of course, and you may enter and leave the polling place during the counts and your place may be taken by another appointed scrutineer. And you can inspect, but this is the very important point, do not ever touch a ballot paper at the count. Never. Hands off. If necessary, put your hands behind your back to stop yourself touching a ballot paper. That is forbidden. What is unacceptable is you must not, it's not a case of you may do things, but you must not stay in a polling place unless you have provided a completed appointment form. So if you haven't got that authority from a candidate, you cannot be there. You must not go into a polling place without your scrutineer's badge, and you must not help with clearing voting booths or the removal of material from the polling place. In other words, don't touch anything, and especially do not touch ballot papers. You must not interfere with any voter or attempt to influence them. And you must not reveal anything you know about how someone has voted. And you must not wear a badge or emblem of a political party or a candidate within the polling place. You must not identify yourself as a supporter of any particular political party or person. You must not deliberately show or leave in the polling place any how to vote cards or similar direction as to how an elector should vote. So not only hands off everything, but don't leave anything lying around. 
And this is a very important thing for scrutineers. You must not use any device with the potential capability of image recording, such as smartphones, where you can take photos and cameras and video recorders in the scrutiny areas of a counting centre. That is, if you are anywhere near the actual ballots, you must not have any of these devices on you. So you will be told to keep your devices well away from where the counting is actually going on. That is very strictly policed. Uh, you mustn't use any image recording device to record images of ballot papers, so no secret spy pens sticking out of your lapel or anything like that, and you can't record uh, declaration envelopes in a polling place or counting centre. So no taking pictures of anything anywhere. You must not unreasonably delay or interfere with the progress of counting the votes. So if you want to make a point and have an argument with a district returning officer, okay, if you do have a point, make it, but don't drag it out because you can get in trouble. Should you fail, should a scrutineer fail to adhere to the above guidelines, they may be asked to leave the polling place or the, the counting centre. So you can actually get escorted out if you cause too much trouble. So you've got to be respectful. But of course, if you uh, see that something is wrong, of course, you have to take a stand on principle. So it's a very responsible position. But you know, the, the bottom line is just behave yourself, people, and don't be difficult. And certainly don't make it difficult for other scrutineers. What is the purpose of scrutiny? Why do we bother with all of this? We vote. And there are only two types of votes, a formal vote, and an informal vote. The only votes that are counted are formal votes. So the purpose of scrutineering is to establish that the ballot paper that you see in front of you is formal, that is, it is able to be counted. And if you find there is a problem with something, you have a right to object. So it's all about making sure that anything that is counted is actually a formal vote. And what is the process then? You have to apply two formality tests to all ballot papers, and you do that with just a glance, and I'll, I'll go into detail in a minute. Then you apply five principles to every ballot paper that passes those initial two tests, and you use a set of guidelines that underpin these principles, and we will go in detail through all of these principles and guidelines. The two formality tests that you can do just at a glance, the first thing you ask is, is this ballot paper authentic? An authentic ballot paper, at the top of it, and this example is a House of Representatives, a green one, there will be some kind of a watermark or a printed security pattern and the initials of the issuing officer. That makes it a formal ballot paper. And if it doesn't have that, you have, you have the right to object and uh, put it in the informal part. And another thing that cannot ever be accepted is if the voter chooses to identify themselves on the ballot paper. Here they say, I voted for you, Goran Tweed. That makes it informal. It will not be counted. So I'm sorry, um, Goran Tweed, you wasted your vote. That is a very rare occurrence, I might add, but, you know, some people will have a go and do that. And, of course, they've wasted their vote. So that's very simple to glance at those two things as, as you uh, look at the ballot paper for the first time. So that's the two formality tests. Then you apply these five principles after applying the two formality tests. First, you must assume that the voter has intended to vote formally. Give people the benefit of the doubt. They turned up to vote. They went to the trouble to do this. You must assume that they intended to have their vote counted. You must also establish the intention of the voter and give effect to this intention. So if the intention is to, to number things and perhaps there's some contentious way that they have numbered something, you have to try your hardest to err on the side of the voter and uh, assume that they wanted to get this vote in. If, of course, they deliberately want to sabotage their vote, well, you can see their intention there if they draw marijuana leaves or write Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck all over things. That would be their intention. But most voters want their vote counted. So, of course, you err in the favour of the voter when there is some doubt. You only have regard to what is written on the ballot paper. No extenuating circumstances. Absolutely no other things are taken into consideration. What's on that ballot paper? Is this a formal ballot paper? The ballot paper 
should be therefore looked at as a whole, construed as a whole. You consider the number in each square as one in a series in the House of Representatives and not as an isolated number. A poorly formed number may be recognisable as the one missing from the series. So again, you go back to err in the favour of the voter that they did intend to write that as a six or a three or whatever is in doubt. So be reasonable and try to give the voter the right to have their vote counted. Those are the five principles. Now, in practical terms, this is how we go through all the details of what can happen. We have guidelines for a lawful numbering sequence. General principles that apply to the assessment of all ballot papers, be they House of Representatives or the Senate, you have to have a consecutive series of numbers. You can't have even numbers and odd numbers or anything like that. It has to be consecutive series of numbers, starting at number one in both cases. There are cases of where things are overwritten and you have to try very hard to see whether that overwriting still identifies this number as a recognisable number. So, and, and that is difficult at times because people do make a mess. You have acceptable forms of numbering, and we will look at those later, but there are a number of acceptable forms of numbering. It's not just Arabic numbers. Empty boxes, there are some circumstances where empty boxes can be accepted, but they are very few and far between, and we'll look at those details. And where you place your vote next to the box that where you were supposed to put the number inside the box, sometimes you can put it beside that box and it will still be acceptable. And, they, and you can have variations in handwriting. That's acceptable if it's still in number and you can still count up right to the end of the uh, available boxes. And the last thing is, if there is a candidate name substitution, well, that's it. Um, sorry, that one's not going to make it because only the people who have been registered to be candidates in this election, in this electorate, are able to be voted for. So candidate and substitution is not acceptable. So we'll look at some examples of that. Now, when we talk about a consecutive sequence of numbers, you have to start with a number one. You can't have repeats like one, one, two, three, four, and you can't skip. You can't say one, three, four, five, six. You, you have to have a consecutive sequence. And you must number all the boxes available in your particular electorate in the House of Representatives. Now, this example here, even though it looks like a big mess with the overwriting, it is actually acceptable according to the guidelines. It's formal because down the bottom, you can just see a number one squeezed in between the logo and that overwritten mess in the box. And up the top, there's an overwritten mess in the box, but there's a very clear number five next to it. And that is acceptable to have something next to the box. So this is a formal vote, even though it looks like a big mess. Some scrutineers would reject this, but that is absolutely acceptable. They have not actually broken any rules. So keep in mind that some things um, will be thrown into the informal pile, but uh, you definitely have a right to challenge that if you think that they have still stuck by the rules. Overwritten numbers that we were talking about before, on the left-hand side, you have something that is formal, despite the fact that it is a bit of a mess. But if you look closely at it and you look at the other numbers in the sequence, remember, you must look at the ballot as a whole. You can see all of the numbers in the sequence. Missing out of those clear numbers are the numbers three and four. And that three and four are quite easily clearly distinguished between each other. So that would be accepted as a formal vote. On the right-hand side, however, it's a mess in that second uh, box from the top, and you can't really tell what it is. Even though you can guess what it is because of the missing number in the sequence, it doesn't matter. You can't recognise that as a number, so that would be rejected as informal. You've got to be very careful with these overwritten ones. I'm At many a booth, there are some robust discussions amongst scrutineers about um, the acceptance of these things. Now, acceptable forms of numbering, there are a number of them. You can have ordinary Arabic numerals, Roman numerals, ordinal, such as first, second, third, etc., or even a mixture of them. If there is clear intention, remember one of the principles was if the voter has indicated a clear intention. On the left-hand side, you have 
this is formal besides uh, the fact that it started with number one and written as um, as ordinal and then and, and two and, and it's just written and then the rest are simply in Arabic. Uh, that is acceptable because it is still recognisable in a sequence of numbers. On the right-hand side, however, the number one is missing and there is a tick in that second box from the top. Ticks and crosses are not acceptable in the House of Representatives. Remember that in the House of Representatives only, ticks and crosses are not acceptable. So no matter where it is, you have to reject that as an informal vote. Empty boxes, they do happen. Sometimes people run out of puff. On the left-hand side, even though the box down the bottom looks to be empty, there's actually a dot in it. If there's anything at all in an empty box, that makes it an informal vote because you cannot recognise what was supposed to be written in there. Also, it is possible uh, that one on the left-hand side could have been accepted if that dot wasn't there because the number that is missing is the last in the series and that is the only one that is acceptable as an empty box in the House of Representatives. But I'm afraid they blew it because they put the dot in there. So it's an informal one. On the right-hand side, there are two empty boxes. That's it. Instantly, um, it is simply informal and only one empty box is acceptable and only if it's the last number. So those are both informal with the empty boxes there. And the placement of votes. On the left-hand side, and this is a tricky one, you'd have to look very closely at the screen, but you can just see uh, something that might be interpreted as a seven. It is on the outside of the box down the bottom and it would be in the series of numbers, would we correct? So that would be accepted as a formal vote. Uh, why you would do something like that is beyond me, but anyway, people do stuff like this. Whereas on the right-hand side, they have put the numbers way over, nowhere near the boxes, but they are very clearly against the names of individual candidates. That is acceptable as a formal vote next to their names. And then you get variations in handwriting. On the left-hand side, this would still be seen as a formal vote because the one that is supposedly a number one is reasonably can be assumed to be a number one if somebody had a slip of the pen. So, all right, that would be accepted. And, of course, the other numbers in the sequence with the process of elimination, it's, it's got to be a number one that they're intending to do. So that is acceptable. And on the right-hand side, it's not a standard way to write a number eight, but it is reasonably assumed to be a number eight. So you've got to put up with people's bad handwritings. And then candidate name substitution. Basically, it is unacceptable, except on the left-hand side, you see a ballot paper where there are eight candidates, but somebody smart aleck has written number nine, Donald Duck. So those eight candidates who are up for election, they have had the numbering in their correct sequence, so that is acceptable. Anything else that is written is disregarded as just simply extra information written, but it, it does not affect the actual count. So that would be accepted as formal on the left-hand side. The other two, however, the one in the middle, there's no consecutive numbering of candidates, of actual candidates, because they've crossed out the names of actual candidates and substituted Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse. So that's it. The whole paper gets thrown out as informal. And then on the right-hand side, um, they've done number one as Donald Duck. And so the number one is not acceptable um, because they have added that extra person. And being the first vote, it negates all of the other votes as well. So they did not start with consecutive numbering with a number one against an actual candidate. So again, you've got to be discerning and you've got to apply common sense. And so that's candidate name substitution. In the Senate, it's quite different. Please be aware, it's a quite different numbering process and a, a quite a different way of accepting things. If you've got anything to do with politics at all, you would realise that in the Senate in Australia, you can vote above the line or below the line in the Senate. You cannot have a bit of both. If you do that, you've instantly got an informal vote, but above the line 
the guidelines say that you must number at least six parties or groups, and you can number more if you want to. And if it's below the line, you must number at least 12 individuals from all various parties all over the place. Those are the guidelines, but there are some exceptions which we will have a look at. So despite those rules of six above and 12 below, there is a process and uh, in uh, the Senate called vote saving in Australia. It is actually formal if in this, and it's only in the Senate that this is acceptable. This vote saving provision will allow for a number one only above the line, just a number one, or any number less than six can be included in the count. So a lot of people don't realize that, but um, you're wasting a lot of your vote and your right to uh, give your preferences to other parties, but it is acceptable only in the Senate. Don't try it in the House of Representatives. Okay, so that's above the line, whereas below the line, you can have less than 12 numbers if you so choose. So in this instance, they've got one, two, three, four, five, six. That is acceptable because they've got at least six numbers below the line. So that's the cutoff. If you had just five of them there, it would be an informal vote. And that is simply accepted as exceptions to the rule, but the Australian Electoral Commission accepts this. So be aware that, that that can happen. Do not reject a paper like this because it hasn't got 12 below the line because it is actually formal and acceptable. Now, overwritten numbers, they have to be accepted if the intention of the voter is clear. In this instance, even though the numbers of five and six are overwritten, it is fairly clear when you look closely which is a five and which is a six. And it's, it's in the, the right sequence of numbers. So that will be accepted as a formal vote. And they're done up to 17 and five and six are easily interpreted as a five or a six and cannot be misinterpreted as either or. So that would be a formal. Again, overwriting is the one that's going to cause you a headache with a scrutineer to interpret really bad handwriting. So do your best. Acceptable forms of numbering, just like in the House of Reps, either above the line or below the line is acceptable to use Arabic, Roman, ordinal, first, second, third, etc., or a mixture of all if the intention is clear. I mean, look at this one here. It starts off with Roman numerals, I, double I, triple I, I, V and V, and then it goes over to Arabic numbers, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is a formal vote. Why anybody would do that is beyond me, but there you go. So make sure that you accept things like that if somebody wants to do something like this. It is not to be rejected. And in the Senate, unlike the House of Representatives, ticks and crosses are acceptable. However, the condition is only one tick or cross is acceptable and only if it's for the number one vote as the first preference. In this instance, there's an X and then there's the numbers that follow it. So that X is obviously denoting a number one. That is acceptable because it is the first preference. In this instance, however, this is informal because they have got an X over in the third column from the left and that would be deemed to be their number one. They've actually put a tick in another column, and that means there's more than one tick or cross. That means instantly it is an informal vote. So they wasted their time doing it that way, lost their vote. And repeating your first preference, if you choose somebody and then you think about it and then you think, all right, let's uh, do somebody else instead and I'll start again. Well, that's it, you've blown your vote. Repeated first preference that means in this instance that no numbers are accepted. Please note that if this were, you had uh, just one number one, if you had one number two after that, and then if you had two number threes, your vote would only exhaust after your number one and your number two were counted. So it would be formal up to number one and number two. And then it would exhaust when it got up to repeated numbers. So repeating is, um, it's a bad idea if anybody's going to do that. And one would think that they've done it simply by mistake. But, and the first preference, if that's the one, that's it. 
nothing gets counted because you can't tell who's the first preference. In this instance here, the number three is repeated. That means that only number one and number two are actual accepted numbers, but there are less than six of the acceptable 12. So this would be an informal vote because there are less than six below the line. And the placement of votes outside the box, perfectly acceptable. Why you do it, I don't know. Perhaps you've got very large handwriting, but that is acceptable so that this cannot be rejected. It is a formal vote. Variations in handwriting. And this figure in the third box, it reasonably resembles the one. And it's quite easily distinguished between that and the number seven. So that can be accepted. That's, uh, you've got to apply common sense. Candidate name substitution, as before, as we mentioned before, not acceptable. You have to vote for actual candidates. No matter where you do it, it's not going to be acceptable. But in this instance here, the voter has numbered at least 12 boxes correctly, so they have applied that rule and they substituted names after those 12 boxes. They will be rejected, but because they've got the 12 boxes, it is a formal vote and they can accept right up to those uh, 12 boxes and no more. Now, for your information, if you are a scrutineer, you are observing all of these ballots. You are also observing the behaviours of other people who may have malicious intent. That is a reality of the world that we live in. There are offences. If you look at pages 60 to 66 in the Scrutineer's Handbook, there are a number of offences listed and there are some very severe penalties that can be handed out to people who are going to misbehave. The misbehaviour is simply as was listed in the very beginning of things you must do and things you must not do. And so if somebody is repeatedly behaving badly, you do have the right to put in an objection to the divisional returning officer. And that person will be held to account with possibly some very severe penalties. The penalty units that it speaks of here under the penalty column, it's worth every penalty unit in Australia at the moment is worth $222. So this is $2,220 that this person will be fined or they go to jail for six months if they do this misdemeanor. So keep that in mind. And if somebody is misbehaving, you might perhaps remind them that these are the penalties for misbehaving. And that's your responsibility as a scrutineer. Thank you. This video is authorised by D. Abel Brisbane for Stand Up and Vote Australia.